Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich, dass Sie heute gekommen sind zu dieser Veranstaltung der Münchner Seminare, einer Reihe, die das IFO-Institut und die Süddeutsche Zeitung seit vielen Jahren gemeinsam veranstalten, manchmal drüben im IFO-Institut, manchmal hier. Das IFO-Institut ist vertreten durch seinen Präsidenten und Professor hier an der Uni, Hans-Werner Sinn. Ich heiße Marc Beise, bin Wirtschaftsredakteur der Süddeutschen Zeitung und wir freuen uns beide gemeinsam mit Ihnen sehr, dass Sie alle gekommen sind, weil Sie unseren heutigen Gast, wir haben viele Gäste über das Jahr, aber unser heutiger Gast findet besonders viel Aufmerksamkeit und das freut mich und ich freue mich sehr, dass Janis Varoufakis nach München gekommen ist. Dear Janis, welcome to Munich. I, uh, I switch to English now because this will be our um, working language for this evening because my Greek is not so good and your German, I think, too. But I know that you, Janis, uh, knows the German, know the German and Germany very well. When you were a child, your father was professor of chemistry and um, he also was a communist. And this was a tough time in the dark area of dictatorship in Greece. And you told us that the family always listened Deutsche Welle. And you told us that this way, this was your gate to the free world. So thank you for this uh, notification. Later, you become a professor yourself, not of chemistry, but of economics. You started in Great Britain in Essex and Birmingham. You were professor at the University of Cambridge. You moved to Australia, where your daughter lives today, whom you dedicated your new book, this book, Time for Change, wie ich meiner Tochter die Wirtschaft erkläre, a book which was published recently by Hansa Verlag, the famous publishing house here in Munich. So thanks to the friends of Hansa Verlag to help us to bring him here to Munich today. Thank you very much. In the year 2000, you came back to Greece working as a professor in Athens. Then you left Greece again, moved to Texas, Austin, Texas, then came back to Greece. You became a politician. You were elected by the people of Athens District B to be a member of parliament for the Syriza party. And um, I have to say, with a great result of votes in this election at the beginning of the year. And then you were appoint appointed to be Minister of Finance. And from this point on, every single person in this room, in this audience, knew who you are. We observed every step you took on the European stage. It was, let's say, unconventional, and uh, some of us liked it, some of us not. I think uh, the majority in Germany did not like the way you handled things, at least the German government didn't like it, I think. And the big question, of course, was all the time how to manage the debt crisis, how to manage the situation that money ran out in Greece, and how to find results for benefiting both the European creditors and Greece and the population of Greece as well. Anyway, you resigned as finance minister after the successful referendum against the fiscal policy of the EC, the successful referendum, and after the referendum, the new, the old government, the old Syriza government, accepted and fulfilled all these things which the European Commission and the European Brussels wanted to do from you. It's a little bit difficult to understand, and perhaps you can today help us to understand and tell us what you understand or not understand. So that should be enough. I would like to ask you to give us a short presentation about you, your politics, your opinions, 
then we will have, we'll hear uh, Hans Werner Sinn, then we will have a discussion on stage, and then we will have a discussion with you in the audience. Janis Varoufakis, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a triple pleasure to be here in your midst tonight. I say triple because firstly, it is always a sense of homecoming, however strange that this may sound to lots of you, to be in Germany, especially in southern Germany, for reasons that have to do with my childhood, which I am not going to elaborate on. The second strand of the pleasure has to do with the fact that I'm in a great university and I've spent all my life in universities. And every time I return after this one year of absence from academic life to one of the great universities of the world, I feel elated and I feel a double homecoming. Thirdly, it's uh, an honor to be sharing a platform with Professor Zinn uh, and to have this opportunity to communicate directly with you and not through the distortionary lens of the media, which has a lot to answer for in this era of crisis, for preventing our peoples in Europe from getting closer together and instead spearheading greater centrifugal forces that are pushing us apart. Allow me to make a small correction, or actually an addition to your introduction about my father, because I think that it would resonate in a German audience. My father was uh, born and raised in Egypt. His mother was French. He was raised in the spirit of the French Enlightenment by a very quirky French woman who raised him on a diet of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Voltaire, but also Immanuel Kant. When he went to Greece at the age of 20, there was, this was a lull in the civil war between the left and the right. And both factions in the university where he was studying chemistry, because there was a, this period of an attempt to have a left-right detente, chose my father, who was a complete outsider, as the president of the Students' Union. And when later on, a few weeks later, there was a, a doubling of the fees for students at a time of great hunger in uh, post-war Greece, 1946, my father did what he should do as the president of the Students' Union, that is, complained to the rector. The secret police arrested him for that subversive act, and um, he was beaten up lightly, just a little bit. And then the good cop came around and said to him, well, here's a document, just sign it and you're out. And it was a document denouncing communism. And my father said to the policeman, to the secret policeman, um, I'm not a communist, but I'm not Muslim either. And I'm not a Buddhist. But if you asked me to denounce Islam or Buddhism, I wouldn't do it. It's none of your business. So he ended up in a concentration camp out of a pure liberal <laughs> rejection <laughs> of the right of the state. And in the end, because he was with communists, he joined the Communist Party. But what he said to me, and I think this would resonate with you here in Germany, is that you know, he said, Yanis, when I was in that concentration camp, and I was a member of the party and was with communists, I, I, back, even back then, I knew that if our side had won, the communist side, I would be in the same concentration camp with different centuries. You see what I mean. These divisions need to be broken down. And unfortunately, in Europe, we, are, we have a lot of those. We had a lot of those. Germany was divided. And unfortunately, this European crisis, this European monetary union crisis, is uh, pushing, as I said before, our nations apart. And this is a great tragedy for me personally. And it's something that is one of the reasons why I threw my hat in the political ring last January. 
Let me speak to you about this decision, as well as the reason why, from a situation where I was a game theorist writing abstract text that no more than 20 people around the world ever wrote or read, and they were not intended to read it because it was highly abstract stuff that was not for public consumption, how it is that I became prominent and then I ended up running for office, parliamentary office, and then government. What happened was, my nation in 2010 went bankrupt, as you all know. I'm not going to go into an analysis now of why that happened, but our state became insolvent in the sense of being incapable of servicing its debt. How did Europe and the Greek governments respond to this? They responded by lending to the most bankrupt member state of the Eurozone the largest sum of money ever lent to anyone in human history under conditions of fiscal consolidation that ensured with probability 100% that our income would shrink. The very income that was incapable of, of sustaining the existing debt now would have to shrink and would have to sustain not only the unsustainable existing debt, but also the new gargantuan bailout loans. It was in January 2010 that I became known in Greece as something beyond just an academic, because I said something that upset the powers that be in Athens, that the Greek state was bankrupt. And when you are a bankrupt entity, you don't have the right to take on new loans until and unless you restructure your debts, and until unless you restructure your operations so as to be able to produce the incomes from which to pay your debts. I thought that that was a straightforward statement to make. I thought that this was common sense. I couldn't believe that anyone would contest that. We could have a discussion as to whether the Greek state was bankrupt or was, it wasn't bankrupt. But this was a discussion that was banned in the European Union in 2010. Anyone who dared have a serious discussion or attempt to have a serious discussion on whether Greece was facing a problem of solvency or a problem of liquidity, not the same thing. If you have a problem of liquidity, you should borrow. If you have a problem with solvency, you shouldn't. Not until and unless you have serious restructuring. Anyone who dared have this conversation was immediately banished as anti-European, as somebody whose views were beyond the pale. Those voices were drowned. And in May 2010, Europe, in its infinite wisdom, indulged in what rogue bankers do, which is extending and pretending. Extending the crisis into the future by means of new loans, pretending that it was solved. When in reality, all that happens is that it gets, the crisis gets deeper, the bankruptcy heftier, and you simply defer to the future where the problem gets worse. Meanwhile, the fabric of uh, the economy, the real economy of Greece was being depleted. And then, of course, when you extend and pretend, either at some point you're going to come clean on this and admit that this is what you're doing, or you're going to give another extended and pretend loan, which is what happened in 2012. Now, the reason why I stood was because I had an agreement with the leader of the party that recruited me that we would go to Brussels and would come to Berlin or to Frankfurt, wherever it was necessary to go, in order to have a serious conversation with our partners, with the International Monetary Fund, and say to them this. We were not elected to extend and pretend further. Let's have a serious discussion about a genuine solution to this problem. Because the longer we perpetuate this extend and pretend, the longer we cover up the problem, the longer we deny the essence of the issue, the greater the damage we are inflicting upon a, a proud nation, the Greeks, who are suffering, who have lost hope, who are turning to Nazism. Remember, the third largest party in Greece is a Nazi party, not a neo-Nazi party. It's a fully-fledged Nazi party of the kind that you have so successfully managed to eradicate from this country. 
And at the same time, the policies that are being tried out in Greece are transplanted in other parts of the Eurozone. The debts of the Greek state are corrosive and toxic for the rest of the Eurozone, and the domino effect is um, transforming itself from the bond markets to the investment markets to deflationary forces that are undermining the capacity of countries like Portugal, like Spain, and so on and so forth, to achieve escape velocity, to escape from the crisis that began in the late part of the 2000s. The reason why I became a polarizing figure was not because this message was recalcitrant, that it was left-wing. There was nothing left-wing in what I said to my colleagues in the Eurogroup. All I said was, to end the Greek crisis and take Greece out of the agenda, something significant must change. Some colleagues of mine, whether they're economists or politicians, believe that that was an exit from the Eurozone. It was not my view. But to perpetuate the last five years, what was going on between 2010 and 2015, by means of further loans, was not an option. My proposal, which you can read, but of course nobody refers to it, because the official version was that I had none. My proposal, the proposal of my ministry, uh, which was co-authored by um, members of my staff, but also people like um, Larry Summers, US Treasury Secretary of the past, Jeff Sachs from Columbia University, James Galbraith from the University of Texas, Thomas Mager, who used to be the chief economist of Deutsche Bank, not exactly left-wingers, okay? Comprised three essential elements. The first element was institutional reforms, which are absolutely necessary to deal with the problem of lack of liquidity within Greece. And in particular, the creation of a bad bank, like you created here in Germany, like Spain created, to deal with the non-performing loans. Because when I took over the ministry, 43% of loans of the banking sector were non-performing. This was a major error, the recapitalization of 2013 of the banking sector, which didn't deal with non-performing loans. This is a classic error. The bad bank, therefore, was necessary in order to use standard financial engineering tools in order to start dealing with the non-performing loans to allow for credit creation. One of the great problems in Greece is that you have companies that are few, not many, who are efficient, they have a full order book, they export, but they have no access to credit. To unleash credit, you need to deal with non... So a bad bank was essential. A development bank, effectively what we were recommending, and I had German advisors working on this, was the creation of a kind of a Troy hunt, but with a banking license to use public assets in order to create a homegrown flow of investment funding into these public assets to develop them, to improve their, their value, instead of going into fire sales, which is what the previous government was doing. The institutional reforms also involved major changes in the tax system, major changes in the tax administration. I was a very strange minister of finance, by Greek standards at least, but not just by Greek standards, because I was arguing that the, taxes, the tax office should be taken out of my purview. It should be removed from the ministry, should be made independent, and it should not be under either political influence, my influence, other politicians' influence, or corporate interest, in, um, interest or influence. So the last part of the reform con process, which we were recommending, concerned pensions, and the link between the pension funds as well as a development bank to create a funding flow of the pension funds in order to uh, redress the fact that 70% of the capitalization of our pension funds evaporated in 2012 with a PSI, with a haircut, because the pension funds were forced to hold Greek government bonds which were haircut in 2012. 
And also, um, essential product market reform. If you look at the price cost margins in Greece, you can see the word cartel staring at you in the face. So that was the reform part. There was a second part that had to do with debt restructuring. But by debt restructuring, what I was proposing was that we split up our debt in the different slices that it comprised, that it consisted of, like our debt to the ECB, our debt to the first program, the GLF program, the first tranche of loans, the GLF that goes back to May 2010, our EFSF loans, as well as our IMF loan. And we were proposing specific debt swaps that did not involve any haircut, except it would smoothen out and link to our nominal GDP um, growth levels, our repayment schedule, in order to create a shock of optimism in the mind of investors who would see these reforms, they would see that the debt rescheduling, sorry, sorry the, the debt payment schedule was doable, manageable, there were no funding cliffs in the future to worry about and start the process of backward induction that leads to the conclusion that you shouldn't invest in Greece today if you're an investor. That was the plan. Let me share you, with you my frustration, which is twofold. Firstly, there was no discussion of this plan. I was, to put it bluntly, not allowed to table it anywhere. I gave it to people. I gave it to my fellow finance ministers on, in bilateral meetings. I gave it to people in the IMF, Commission, and so on. But it was never discussed at any formal forum, ever. And the second fault of the frustration is that while I was struggling to have a sensible discussion, I wanted somebody to tell me what was wrong with that pro program. For instance, as an academic, um, all sorts of leaks were coming out of Brussels that we had no plan. It's one thing to have criticisms of your plan, to be told that your plan is foolish. I accept that. As an academic, I thrive on criticism. But I can assure you it's extremely frustrating when not only are they not accepting to discuss your plan, but then they leak to the press, and then that becomes a fact for everyone that we didn't have a plan. We didn't know what Varoufakis wanted. We didn't, he didn't have a plan. <laughs> I can assure you this is extremely both frustrating and indicative of the state of debate in Europe. Let me finish, because I've already spoken far longer than I wanted to speak, by saying that the outcome in the end was a surrender of our government and a major defeat for Europe. Let me put it very simply, and this is how I'm going to conclude for now until we start the discussion. Beginning of July, we had a new MOU, a new Memorandum of Understanding, a new agreement, which I consider to be of the old kind, the extend and pretend, which I would not sign because it involved 85 billion new loans, which I know that it is impossible to repay under the conditions of this package as it was presented in Parliament. And that's why I resigned because I was not going to be yet another Greek minister who makes pledges that he knows he cannot fulfill. It was not that important to me to be a minister. And let me now add to the point as to why this was a defeat for Europe. Who believed in this MOU that was pushed down the throat of my prime minister? Did the IMF believe in it? No. They've already said it. They think that the Greek debt is unsustainable with this program. They think that this reform package is not going to work. Did the Commission believe in it? I don't believe so. From conversations I had with very high-ranking people whose name I'm not going to mention. Did Wolfgang Schäuble believe in it? I can assure you he didn't. We discussed it. He didn't believe in it. He had either suggestions as to what we should do, and Professor Zin is going, I'm sure, to refer to them, or if he doesn't, I will. 
So this is a country that has been in a debt deflationary spiral that is equivalent to a Great Depression for five, six years. And everyone in Europe, Greek government, German government, European Commission, the IMF, are imposing upon this economy a program that no one believes in. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit this to you, that this is a defeat for Europe and indicative of the fact that we have created a monetary union that was not designed to sustain the shockwaves of a major financial crisis like that which unfolded after 2008. And now we are in denial. We are not discussing, we don't have a serious conversation on how we want to reform the architecture of the Eurozone. And Greece being the flimsiest part of it, is the one that festers like an open wound and we always talk about it. But Greece is insignificant for you here in Munich. It's significant for me because I'm a Greek. What is significant for you and for us today is that Greece is simply indicative of the fact that the Eurozone is not sustainable. And the big question is, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, Professor Varoufakis, uh, thank you very much for giving us the great honor of uh, participating in this evening's debate here in the Munich seminar. Usually we are just about 50 people. Today I guess we are 800, 900 people in this room. This is due to you. Uh, everyone wants to hear your opinions. Uh, we have all seen you in TV lots of times, and now we see you in real life. And I look forward to an interesting debate. You started already very well. Uh, <laughs> by uh, pointing to the difficulties which your country uh, has faced. And uh, I uh, admire you for your frankness, I must say. I have done that all the time. All the years before you became a finance minister, I knew you from your writings. Uh, we had both shared the interest in the European crisis, and I endorse your view. It's a one very fundamental crisis, and it's not yet over by no means. Extent and pretend has been the game, as you correctly said. <clears throat> Rather than facing the truth and accepting uh, the reality, politicians tend to kick the can down the road in order to gain time. They say for reforms, what they mean is uh, time for not acting and uh, uh, leaving it to their successors to deal with the, with the problem. However, sometimes the problems reappear faster than they had anticipated. So Greece is bankrupt. It was bankrupt already in 2010, as you rightly pointed out and we pretended it was not uh, replaced private credit with public credit in these rescue operations of 2010, starting in April 2010, when the intergovernmental um, help was given to Greece and then later, then later the EFSF money which, which Greece received. I thought at the time it was a big mistake. Uh, not that I didn't want to help Greece, my position was uh, we should not become creditors of Greece. We should give Greece money uh, to help uh, overcome a temporary liquidity crisis if it was one. That one doesn't know in, in ex ante, but that money should be a gift and we should not reclaim it. Because reclaiming money uh, and making conditions for that money, imposing conditions is the recipe for uh, creating hassle and strife. 
uh, there is one saying in German, uh, don't lend to your friend, because if you lend to your friend, he stops being your friend. This, I thought, was the very, very big mistake. You know, had the private creditors um, to face uh, the, the right of losses, they would have been angry. Some of them would have been in difficulties, but so what? Uh, in the end, someone has to be angry and in difficulty. Uh, the creditors would have been diffuse. Some investors throughout the world and uh, the natural and potential hassle and strife between a creditor and a debtor when the debtor is close to bankruptcy, we always observe that, would be a, a problem between the Greek government and its private creditors. Now, the private creditors have been replaced by Mrs. Merkel, the German state, and the natural dispute is now one between Greece and Germany. And that is a tragedy. For me, this is the big tragedy of uh, these operations. They were uh, claimed to be peace-creating rescue operations. I don't want to say they have created war, of course not, but um, the outcome was a lot of hassle and strife and tensions, which uh, were not so nice. And then you rightly pointed out to the press, and the press is today here, I hope, uh, the press stops scandalizing statements. Uh, we are serious people, we want to seriously talk to one another, and we don't want to be ridiculed by extreme uh, citations of parts of sentences and so on. So what can we do now? What is the essence of the European crisis? If it was only a debt crisis, then um, uh, giving debt relief in one way or another would be sufficient. I'm for debt relief. I always wa was for it because it makes no sense to uh, pretend you get your money back if you don't. Uh, it's much better to face the reality. But it would not be enough because the creditor, uh, the debtor, sorry, would, be, would have to be made competitive and to be able to uh, repay. And Greece certainly is not. Uh, last year, Greece had uh, a trade deficit, even though it has mass unemployment. And suppose Greece returns to normal employment, uh, then it would have huge imports, and it would still have a, a much bigger trade deficit. So the cash flow, even if it did not have to pay any interest, would be negative. And that is the problem. So Greece needs to devalue to become competitive. Like so many other countries, it's not only Greece, uh, the problem was the introduction of the euro. It brought down the interest rates, it was tempting to borrow, the governments borrowed, private people borrowed uh, for, build, for, for buying real estate, so there was a big bubble set forth uh, by uh, the introduction of the euro, and regulatory mistakes uh, contributed to that. I could explain that, but you know what I mean. And this bubble um, inflated these economies because the wages increased faster than the productivity in the traded goods sectors, and that implied increasing uh, prices. These increasing prices have uh, deprived Southern Europe of their competitiveness. We also can speak of a real revaluation. Uh, we have open revaluations when countries have a separate currency. They, it becomes more expensive and the country loses its competitiveness, but we can have exactly the same thing if we have the same currency and the price level increases. It, and uh, that is the problem. So while Germany and similar countries had flat prices, the Greek prices were exploding, the Spanish prices were exploding, uh, the Portuguese prices were exploding, and that uh, destroyed the competitiveness. The countries became dependent on foreign credit, developed structural current account deficits, which had to be financed, and uh, these have not yet disappeared. If they have improved, they have improved, it is because of the collapse of Southern Europe. The collapse was enormous. Uh, Greece industrial production, manufacturing production went down by 30%. The Spanish actually the same, to the same extent. 
And if you collapse an economy, you, the economy can't afford the imports, and then you have a balanced current account. But it is not a sustainable thing, and it is not a structural balance of the current account. So we have to think more radically about how to solve the European problem. There are only four possibilities in theory, and we can choose between them, among them, or take a mixture. The first is we accept the lack of competitiveness as is, and um, just keep financing it by having a European transfer union. Germany has a transfer union with East Germany, West and East Germany. We know what it means. Uh, it means lots of money, and it keeps the transfer recipient in the Dutch disease. Dutch disease is a technical term. The, the Netherlands had found gas in the 60s. The uh, proceeds from selling the gas allowed them to increase their wages and uh, that destroyed the, the export industry. Uh, only when the gas price fell after 82, after the uh, second oil crisis, did they gradually recover because they had less money than before. Hmm? So even if we can make a transfer union, it's expensive and it keeps the recipient part in a permanent Dutch disease where they will never recover. East Germany has not recovered. There was no convergence between East and West Germany. Uh, has, no, has been no convergence for the last 20 years. Actually, East Germany grew a little less than West Germany's uh, during that period of time. So the, the, the second possibility is we ask those countries that inflated too much to cut their prices again. Uh, if you went up too fast, please go down again. But that's easier said than done because these countries are over indebted, as you rightly pointed out. You cannot go through a deflationary period because that is a recipe for disaster. Germany experienced that in the Weimar Republic. Uh, when we were forced to deflate because we were unable to escape the gold standard, unlike the Brits. And this deflation led to uh, a situation which brought Germany to the brink of a civil war, and what happened in 1933 was even worse than a civil war. So the second possibility is not possible. The first is um, expensive and not so favorable for the recipients. The second is not possible. The third possibility is to inflate the North. That's what the ECB now tries with its QE program. They pour lots of money over the European economy, hoping that some of the money goes abroad and devalues the euro. A devaluation of the euro would increase the import prices and would allow the exporters to increase their prices. So we inflate the North and thereby make the South again competitive. But that, for that to happen, First, the South has to stay put, which is a sort of austerity. They cannot also inflate and let the North uh, deprive its uh, or kill its own competitiveness by, in, uh, to some extent, increasing or say it in another word, which the North should, should improve its terms of trade. Actually, it would be an advantage also for, for the North. And the second difficulty is, will the ECB actually succeed in inflating the North? It's not so easy in the moment we don't see it, even if in theory it would work. So this, the choice set looks pretty empty, empty. And the fourth possibility that remains is exit. And that is why I think we should talk about exits. My idea is that uh, for the time being, we need a breathing Euro, Eurozone a situation where a country cannot only enter but also exit. We have to have rules for orderly exits from uh, the Eurozone, exits which would the, uh, make the country competitive. And in the case of Greece, I would think it would have helped because first, the exit uh, and devaluation would have uh, made the imports more expensive, so consumers would have uh, bought more domestic goods. Yeah. The remainders of the old textile industry, which once was very productive, could be revitalized. Uh, agriculture in general could be revitalized. Second, tourism would, would get another boost. And third, the flight capital would return because everything is cheap. You know? so, suppose the drachma devalues to 50%. The 150 billion or so flight capital, which came from Greek people 
to the rest of the world could return. People would come, buy their real estate, and uh, that would create a, a construction boom. We have seen the same thing in Italy in 1992 after the devaluation of the lira. Then everyone came and bought Italian houses, and there was a construction boom that got the economy going. So I think it is a rather safe recipe for, um, for igniting new growth. Instead, trying the impossible inside the euro will uh, be uh, this extend and pretend thing, even if we uh, give debt relief. It will not help in the long run. But of course, there are strong forces in Europe that do not want it. There are people who say, if you begin with one country, then the next country might imitate that. And that cannot be, then in the end, the euro is under risk. I do not understand this, frankly. I always thought the euro is an instrument to achieve a goal, namely peace and prosperity for Europe. But now we make the euro a goal by itself. And that is dangerous because we have seen, that reminds me actually of what, something we have seen in my country with uh, communism. No? Communism was said to bring peace and prosperity. It didn't. So then communism became an ideological goal by itself, and you, could, you were not allowed to doubt communism. Once you have arrived there, I think uh, uh, ordinary reasoning has stopped, and we should, I think, uh, not make that mistake. We should be open, frank, and speak about all possibilities that exist, because not the euro is the goal. The goal is European integration, peace, and prosperity. Thank you very much. So, a lot of stuff for you to respond, please. <laughs> May I begin by yet again registering how happy I am to be here and to be having this conversation in such a relaxed manner in Germany between a German economist and a green economist. This is the integration that we need in this continent instead of the shouting matches we've had, instead of the toxic press, instead of Bild Zeitung versus Greek newspapers. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I had to express that great sense of well-being that I'm experiencing at this moment, and then immediately come to your talk and to say that I'm struggling to find something to disagree with, <laughs> except one thing, except one thing. Your analysis is, of course, completely correct, and it's more or less a reflection also of what I said, so we are like mirror images of one another. My disagreement and deep concern touches upon one issue. Your arguments are splendid arguments as to why we should not have created the Eurozone. My position on the Euro has been distorted many times by the press because I've always said that I wish that Greece had not entered the Eurozone for reasons that Professor Zin so beautifully outlined. And indeed, in the 1990s, I lost lots of friends in Greece because I publicly opposed Greece's entry into the Eurozone. I actually opposed the entry of almost everyone into the Eurozone because I thought that it was... I don't have a problem with a single currency. I have a problem with this single currency, the way it was designed. But my fear is that once you're in the Eurozone, this is another matter to say that you shouldn't have gotten in from saying you should get out. Because the, the path matters. It's economics, not just of statics. I wish we were out of the Eurozone. But getting out of the Eurozone once you're in is a very significant problem. Let me be precise. What would it take? I was Minister of Finance. And people asked me, Minister, don't you think we should start planning for Grexit for the reasons that Professor Zin outlined? How do you do it? You mentioned 1992. That was when Italy, as well as Britain, escaped the ERM. And the result was that uh, they avoided a major depression, both Italy and uh, Britain. 
And they did very well to escape there. I mean, it's similar to what happened in 1931 when Britain escaped the, the, the gold standard, when in 2002, when Argentina cut a peg with the US dollar. These uh, fixed exchange rate regimes are designed to fail. What happens is, the moment you establish the, the fixed exchange regime, you've got what Professor Zin was saying, you've got over borrowing by the deficit regions, but at the same time, you know, it's a symmetrical problem. Because of the fixity of the exchange rate, the surplus regions like Germany tend to accumulate a very large surplus, which then depresses effective interest rates. So the bankers in Frankfurt have an incentive to go to Spain, to Greece, to Ireland, and find borrowers to lend from them. So it's a totally symmetric problem. Now, in 1992, though, Italy had the lira. <clears throat> the lira was pegged to the Deutschmark. And what happened well, then was that this peg was broken. Just like sterling was decoupled from the gold standard um, in 1931, from the ERM again in 1992, Argentina was decoupled, the peso was decoupled from the US dollar. Now, we didn't have the drachma last month, or, you know, when I was minister. I didn't have a peg to snap. To get out of the Eurozone, I had to create a currency to devalue it. But the mechanics matter, because this would mean, and I, of course I, I looked into it, it was my moral and political duty to look into it, regardless of whether I agreed or, or not with the idea of Brexit. It would take a minimum of 12 months from the moment I would decide to create a new currency and therefore exit, to the moment when the new currency would be fully functional, the ATMs would churn it out, the banking system would be recalibrated, the payment system would be ready to handle it. This is equivalent, going back to the 1992 example with Italy, imagine if in, in Italy 1992, the Ministry of Finance were to announce that in a year's time, Italy would devalue the lira in a year's time. You go back to the Stone Age, effectively. Yeah? You give 12 months to speculators as well as to residents to sell everything, to convert in the Deutschmark, to bring everything to Frankfurt a year. Even if you give them two days, you are, going, you are in serious trouble. And there is no way you can start this process of creating a new currency to devalue it without it leaking. I had a team in my ministry, actually in the room next door to my office, uh, working on this plan B. By the way, a little aside here, uh, for weeks after uh, my resignation, I was being castigated by the international press of being an idiot, not having a plan B. When I came up with the news that I did have a plan B, I was castigated for high treason <laughs> for having a plan B. This is the Euro fetishism that yeah, Professor yeah. Zin was talking about. We turned the currency into a fetish, a fetish, a fetish. Yeah? So whether you are for the euro, you're fetishizing the euro, but even in, in my country, colleagues of mine who wanted to go to Dragma fetishized the Dragma. Suddenly going to the Dragma, especially the left-wingers in my party, thought that this was the road to socialism. I said to them, I grew up with the Dragma, I don't remember Greece being socialist. So, that was, that's an aside, and, and strengthening your argument that, indeed, and this is a very important point, currencies are instruments which we ought to be using for the perpetuation and the persecution of common objectives for prosperity, for peace, for freedom. I agree. In Europe, we have fetishized currencies, whether we're in favor of one currency or the other. Okay, I close this bracket now and go back to the issue. Imagine, however, a situation where all transactions were electronic. If all transactions were electronic in Greece when I was minister, this fear of devaluation would go away. Of, because you wouldn't, you, at the touch of a button, it's no longer euros, it's Greek euros or drachmas. That would change completely the discussion between us and the institutions and other governments. Because how were we crushed, and we were crushed, 
because the ECB decided to impose the Troika's will upon us by threatening and then doing, carrying out a bank closure. But if all payments are electronic, it doesn't matter. You don't need to go into a bank, actually. Huh? And then suddenly it would be much easier to have a genuine discussion about things that matter. So I'm all in favor of digitization of money, independently of whether you think we should stay in the, all in the euro or go our separate ways. And the last point I want to make, however, creating some difference between Professor Zinn and myself. As I said before, your arguments are excellent arguments as to why I should not have created the euro. But now that we've created it, and where we are where we are, at this present point in time, I very much fear the centrifugal forces that will be unleashed upon Europe if we break up, especially given that we, have, we don't have full digitization and there will be severe, severe transaction costs involved. My great fear is that with the global economy still incapable of achieving escape velocity from the previous crisis, partly to a large extent to Europe's inability to get its act together. We are a great impediment to global growth. We are doing much damage to Latin America, to China, to the, to the United States, to India, by not managing to overcome the crisis of the Eurozone. Now, if at this juncture we split up, I have no doubt that there is going to be a division in Europe between a stagflationary part, a part involving, let's say, Italy, Greece, other countries, call it the Latin, the Latin Union, where you're going to have devaluing currency, high inflation, and continuing unemployment, while at the same time, in Germany, in Holland, in Slovakia, in Finland, you're going to have the current deflationary uh, process reinforced by a revaluing currency in a world of effectively a competitive devaluation, which is what's happening now between the United States, China, and so on. And my great fear is political here. If you have north of the Alps and maybe east of the Rhine, a deflationary phase with a stagflationary phase everywhere else in Europe, in the current global conditions, I very much fear a postmodern 1930s, which is going to make integration in Europe a thing of the past, make it even harder, and the only beneficiaries of that will be the ultra-right wing, the nationalists, those who actually loathe Europe and loathe democracy. Let me, let me ask you to, to have it very clear. If I understand you, understood you correct, plan B, exit from the euro, theoretically, you are following the arguments of Professor Zinn. That's correct. But you say it's practically, we, can't, we couldn't do it. It was difficult because we had no currency. It's difficult because of the political discussions. But if you, if you hear the arguments of the, the economic arguments of Professor Zinn, you agree with him or not? I agree with the economic arguments of Professor Zinn as to why we would all have been better off without the euro. I disagree that my country's objective ought to be Grexit. And I have to tell you this, and I have to be very clear on this, it was never used as a threat by us during the negotiations. It was not on our radar screen. I did have weapons in the negotiations. In the end, I was not allowed to use them. But the weapon was to default to the ECB if the ECB closed their banks, banks that the ECB had deemed to be solvent. And also <laughs> to create a parallel payment system, an electronic parallel payment <coughs> system, in case our banking system was shut down. <coughs> Maybe Professor Zinn would like to comment on a proposition that it would be far easier if we agree, if we agree, I'm not saying we do agree, if we agree that the Eurozone is not sustainable and it should be broken up, Maybe Germany should leave the Eurozone. 
And I don't mean this as a joke. I can see lots of you smiling. When you are a surplus nation, you can exit a monetary union without the problems that I was referring to before. Because everybody is, expects that an exit from a monetary union, if you're a surplus country, will bring about a revaluation. You don't have the flight of capital from your country. My view is that we should try to fix the Eurozone. But that's a big discussion which we may or may not have tonight. We may have it. <laughs> yeah, this is a serious uh, suggestion, of course. Uh, George Soros has argued the same way, and uh, those who are, might be interested, I had a, a debate on uh, Project Syndicate. You find it in the internet with George Soros which went to and fro about Germany's exit, Greece's exit, and so on. Uh, my argument against Germany's exit is that that would um, uh, bring apart countries which um, could easily uh, cooperate in the future. I, I, I do see this realignment problem of relative prices, uh, which we share as a, uh, to see as a problem. But I don't think it is always as big as uh, between um, your country uh, and, and, and Germany. Between France and Germany, there is a little realignment problem that can be solved inside the, uh, the currency union. Also between Italy and Germany, uh, the necessary devaluation of Italy according to uh, calculations of the economics department of Goldman Sachs, which I cited, was, is just 15%. So it's manageable by, to have a disinflation period uh, by just stepping a little bit backwards while Germany inflates away. So there is at least a chance for it. We should not uh, give up the whole thing. You, I think you would agree that uh, even if uh, the euro was a bad idea the way it was constructed in the first place, there, there, there was a set of countries and a set of rules under which uh, the euro would have made sense in the first place, or not. I mean, this is my opinion. And if this is so, uh, we should not tear the whole thing apart. I would rather give Greece the possibility to exit, and I think it seriously that this would be an advantage for the people in your country. Uh, with a return option, also Wolfgang Schäuble, who brought in this return option, uh, had a serious proposal. He, I think he, he had a good will when he said that. Uh, is it so difficult to um, administer that? You know more about it than I, because you spent half a year in, um, in discussing that with your friends, I agree. But I always thought it could be done, even if you do, not, if you do have banknotes, uh, in the following way. Uh, overnight, you declare all contracts uh, that exist in Greece, including uh, credit contracts, include, including rental contracts between Greek people uh, to be in drachma. All price tax in drachma, all wages in drachma. The numbers stay the same, you just cross out the euro sign and uh, replace it with the drachma sign. And including the bank accounts, of course, the electronic part. And then the difficulty is what are you doing with the banknotes? That, of course, is true. You cannot collect the euro banknotes. Impossible for technical reasons. So my suggestion was give them to the Greek people. So it was just 20% of GDP, so what? The overall public credit which Greece received, if you take everything together, ECB, Target, and so on, is 200% of GDP. So another 20% would not have... Hätte den Kohl nicht fett gemacht, to uh, you understand German. <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, the, the euro banknotes could have served uh, for everyday transactions, even though the drachma is the legal tender. But I thought it would, be, would have been important to make the drachma legal tender, because uh, you had to bring down uh, these long-term contracts, credit contracts, and rental contracts. You know, that's the difficulty if you go through a real devaluation. Uh, you can cut the prices, you can cut the wages, 
but what are you doing with these long-term contracts? People would go bankrupt because they can't pay their rent. And the advantage to convert everything to drachma is that all these long-term contracts would auto automatically be in drachma. Remains the problem of the foreign debt, but that is a separate issue that has to be treated anyway through a haircut. We, we agree that Greece was bankrupt, so there was no way for the foreign creditors to get their money back anyway, uh, and, and that has to, their relief has to be given under all circumstances. So that's not an issue that has very much to do with the exit or not exit possibility. And, you know, uh, just one final remark. The IFO Institute has done a study on the basis on the, of the Reinhard Rogoff data set uh, already uh, in 2012 or 13 on the question, uh, did it really help to devalue? We studied 71 countries uh, which went into a currency crisis and devalued. And in nearly all these cases, they recovered after one year. After two years, there was a strong boom. And the similar result on the same 70 countries has been published by Oxford University, uh, Oxford Economics uh, this spring. You, you must know that. So mm -hmm. there is very strong <coughs> empirical evidence that a devaluation works. Korkman from Finland said it the other day. Finland is now in a similar situation. Since Nokia mm -hmm. is dead, mm -hmm. uh, it, it needs to devalue. Otherwise, they, they have a similar problem as you have. And, and he said the only possibility that really works is a devaluation. Now, I agree. Once you're in and we have this unit of the euro, it's very difficult to disentangle that, but it's not impossible. It depends on, on the disadvantages and advantages of the different possibilities. Staying in the euro is a disaster. It will be a disaster uh, for a very, very long time, another decade or so, will people in some southern European countries suffer. There will be mass, mass unemployment. And if you take the size of these difficulties to, into account, then I think the, the difficulties, the technical difficulties which we have by transforming the currency are of minor importance. Three points. Firstly, the mechanics of redenomination. Because we looked at it very carefully. We have, we have a report. Yeah. Maybe I'll actually share it with you. It's not a report that I've made, but maybe I'll share it with you. Um, we called it Plan X, by the way, not Plan B. Um, that particular redenomination study. The more you look at it, the more complicated it looks. The more carefully you look into the mechanics and the legal aspects and the political difficulties and impediments in doing it, uh, the more you start panicking um, about the prospect of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of it, but you must also remember that we are highly integrated in the European economy now. So there are sequential contracts which it is impossible to, dis to, to, to disentangle between Greek companies, the European Investment Bank, commercial banks in Greece, commercial banks in France, in Germany. And if you redenominate part of that chain, uh, you end up with Lehman Brothers likes, li 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 like like um, chain reactions, which are impossible <laughs> to predict from you know the the finance ministry offices. That's a very important point. That's the first point. The second point. I'll refer to Wolfgang Schäuble. It is true that Dr. Schäuble made this suggestion to me, and he was a quite animated and well-meaning in exactly the same way that Professor Zinn thinks that it would be a good idea for the Greek people, and maybe the Finns and maybe some others, maybe the Portuguese, uh, to disentangle themselves from the, the monetary union. So did your finance minister, and he came up with, a particular, with, with this idea. Now, by the way, the timeout idea I'd reject. Because if we were out, I, don't, I wouldn't want to come back in. No? If, no. If you pay the price, unless we totally reconfigure the Eurozone and we create checks and balances and a commonality of debt and a proper banking union, then I would consider coming, coming back in. But if you pay the price of getting out, then why do you want to come back in? <laughs> but I'm against paying the price to get out. <laughs> 
the, let, let me be, I mean, don't tell anyone outside this room. This is just totally between us. Yeah. <laughs> That's a private conversation. It's a private conversation. <laughs> the problem with uh, Dr. Schäuble's uh, suggestion, and this is a political problem, and I want to share this with you, was that he didn't have a mandate to make this proposal to us, even though he did. You understand what I mean by that? No. <laughs> All right, let me spell it out. I do not believe that the Chancellor agreed. So it was a discussion we had, it was his view, but the German government as a whole did not take that position, which is indicative of the great difficulty we had, and I had personally, during this, that negotiation. Remember what Henry Kissinger once said about Europe? I don't know who to call when I want to speak to Europe. You don't know who to speak to. You speak to the chancellor in this country, you get one view. You speak to the finance minister, you get another view. The same thing with the commission. You speak to somebody high up, like Moscovici, you get one view. You speak to people below, you get a completely different view. IMF, same thing. You have no idea how frustrating it was not knowing who to talk to. <clears throat> Maybe with uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, I would have found it much easier to sit down if it was just between the two of us, but we actually never negotiated. But in the public, it was always said that the finance ministers had to find an agreement, and that would then be endorsed by the heads of state. You know, was not right? You know what? I don't know, really. <laughs> it's a mess. European decision-making is a mess. The Eurogroup doesn't decide, and it decides. That sounds like a contradiction. It's not. It's almost Hegelian. The Eurogroup is the one that makes all the final decisions, but not because of the negotiations within the Eurogroup. In the Eurogroup, there is actually no negotiation going on. What happens is the president opens the discussion on some issue, Greece, Portugal, Spain, whatever. First, the representative of the commission speaks, Mr. Moscovici usually. Then Mario Draghi speaks on behalf of the ECB. They give you their story. Then the IMF outlines its position. Then the relevant minister of finance has 10 minutes to say something. <laughs> then the others speak. And then we spend most of the time arguing about the communique that will come out at the end of the meeting. That's the Eurogroup for you. It's, a, it's an awful system of governance. And yet it's the one that makes the decisions. Uh, but then, of course, the real decisions happen behind closed doors, with their leaders, talking to one another, giving instructions to their finance ministers. It's not the way to run the world's most significant, most significant economy. I think we can agree on that. That was the second point. <laughs> and the third point I want to make is, you mentioned four options that we have for the Eurozone. And effectively, and I agree with you, it's the first and the fourth of the four that you mentioned, the second or the third I rejected. The first one is to create a transfer union, and the fourth, if I remember correctly, is to break this thing up, to say it was a bad idea, let's undo it. Not the whole thing. Well, marginal exits and re-entry possibilities. That's there we view. will have to agree to disagree that um, the extent to which you can contain the fragmentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, I, I, I can see that, that, that you resist, you, you disagree with those of us who believe that it will be very difficult to prevent once Greece comes out, Portugal coming out, or speculation about Italy and so on and so forth. Uh, still, partial or over, or, 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 or I, it would never be a complete fragmentation. It was, it's always, my, my understanding is, for instance, that the Buddhist Bank always envisaged a small Eurozone. Small Eurozone does not mean the destruction of the Eurozone. It means that peripheral states get out. The big question is France. You seem to think, from what you said, that France is sustainable within a monetary union along the lines of Maastricht with Germany. It's not my view. It is true that if you look, if you do standard macroeconomic calculations of uh, optimal nominal interest rates and um, effective exchange rates. It doesn't look as if it is far off German. I personally don't think, this is another big discussion, that dynamically speaking, the French economy and the German economy can be bound together simply monetarily. I don't think that, but that's another big discussion. Allow me to suggest that there is a fifth option. 
And the fifth option would be to use existing institutions in a way that address the imbalances, the gross imbalances that we now have, uh, without having the need for the transfer union, the, your first option, and without crashing countries like Portugal, Greece, Spain, and so on and so forth with a depression in order to uh, create this. Let me just, if I'm allowed, just, just, just give a couple of examples of what we could do under the existing design, and not in order to perpetuate this, in order to solidify this and to cement this, but as a first step towards a proper federation, which is separate from a, a transfer union. Um, let me give you one example. At the moment, we have quantitative easing by Mario Draghi, which, because of the charter of the ECB and because of the existing rules, forces him to do something that he disagrees with, which is to buy primarily German debt. In proportion. In proportion, primarily. I said, we are the biggest country. Because this is the distribution of the shares of the, of the ECB. Now, Germany does not need, it's not good for Germany to have these purchases of German bonds because there is a short of, uh, shortage of bonds. You have negative yields here, pension funds are suffering, savers are suffering, and at the same time, Spain doesn't benefit by that much. So you, you don't have inflation here, and you don't have the end of depression in, in the periphery. The system breaks down. But imagine if we were to do a different kind of QE, whereby the European Investment Bank and its offshoot, the European Investment Fund, were to embark upon a well-designed, and that's a big ask, but nevertheless, a well-designed program of investing into startups, into green energy sources, into productive activities in the periphery, which are now starved of funding. And Draghi, or the ECB, instead of purchasing government debt, to be purchasing the secondary markets, if necessary, the European Investment bond, uh, Bank bonds that are issued in order to affect this. So effectively, that would be doing what? It would be transfer, it would be energizing, it would be utilizing, mopping up, idle seven savings in places like Germany, Holland, and so on, and converting them into investments in productive activities, but targeted in, in sectors and companies that are potentially productive and which are now starved of credit in the periphery. That would <coughs> alleviate the imbalances without creating inflationary for forces, without creating the inflation in asset prices that the QE now is creating in the stock exchanges of Germany and so on and so forth. So this is one example. Imagine also that at the same time that in order to strengthen the rules of Maastricht, we created an interest rate differential between the Maastricht compliant part of the debt of each member, zone, member state of the Eurozone and the excessive debt over and above 60% of GDP by means of having the ECB uh, mediating between the money markets and member states just for that part of, this, of, of the debt in order to improve the self-governance of public debt within the Eurozone. There are things we can do in the Eurozone in order to create more consolidation and give ourselves a polit the political space which is necessary in order to start thinking of the United States of Europe. Very short to this point, yeah, if you want. I, yeah. I, I... <clears throat> Here I also agree, uh, you know, I sent you my book in the last chapter, you have exactly that proposal. Uh, I think there is no alternative to European integration indeed, uh, given this horrible past. And for me this is all a sequencing problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what I object to is sharing the purse before having signed uh, the marriage contract. You know, that is very fundamental because uh, sharing the purse through all sorts of uh, debt mutualization activities and budget mutualization activities means that uh, we will never get uh, the, the political union which we need. 
A political union foremost is uh, uh, a foreign defense union. If you think of uh, the United States, of uh, Switzerland, which are functioning political unions, they put their military forces together and created one army. I found it unbelievable up to the, that we have 28 armies in <laughs> the European Union. This is ridiculous. We should put them together. Hmm? Yeah. And then, if we really create a common state, then we can do lots of things uh, with a common budget and so on, as the Americans do, which, which has automatic stabilizers and transfers of, uh, to a limited extent. But we should not uh, do that prematurely, in particular not uh, through this investment fund of Junkers. I think this oh, yeah, is that's, a, that, a that's an uh, attempt to circumvent uh, the uh, debt uh, deficit rules. It's a shadow budget uh, of the kind which we were complaining the banks were building up in, Luxem in, 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 um, in Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, the government, in the end, cannot decide which private projects are worth carrying out and which not. Uh, here we may share, uh, we may have different opinions. So, uh, the Juncker Fund is a big uh, co-financing operation where the decisions of the markets are um, changed through political will. And this is ultimately investment steering. I think that should not be done, and the ECB should not be involved in buying uh, the bonds of this Juncker fund as it will. Uh, the decision of QE was that 20% of the funds will be used for such purposes. Uh, that is um, not in line with the mandate of the ECB, and it is uh, a circumventing uh, Article 125, which uh, forbids state finance with the printing press. Uh, we don't take the, the treaty serious anymore, but uh, I find this terrible. We should um, change the treaty if we want to do it differently. But we should not, under the carpet, so to say, and uh, uh, in an invisible way, uh, do all sorts of ugly things which are, in fact, forbidden. Okay, we now should uh, should give the audience the chance to comment and to ask. Uh, one last question from my side. Could you please um, tell us a little bit uh, about your mistakes? I mean, <laughs> you told us about your frustration and you told us about this uh, terrible um, European processes and so on, and we have very strong opinion, as we have heard today. But what did you wrong? What did you make wrong? How many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say three. <laughs> three points. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> Firstly, as Larry Summers said to me, Larry Summers, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, said to me, Yanis, you made a very big mistake. First time we met. He said, what? You won the election. No, that's a joke. But it's true. <laughs> he said that. You won the election. That was a big mistake. The election or the referendum? No, the election. That was in okay. January. Uh, but the serious story there is because we were not... Uh, we we're not prepared for it because we thought that the government would survive another year at least. So... It is true that uh, our proposals, our anti-memorandum or alternative memorandum, had not taken shape. I wish that I had walked into the ministry with that document ready. Um, I uh, it, it was, it caught us, the election, the general election caught us by surprise, caught me by surprise. So it was a race against time to prepare our proposals. They were ready very quickly by comparison, but I wish they were ready a month before they were. That's one mistake. A second mistake was that I did not publicize them, these proposals, uh, in good time. The reason why I didn't publicize them was because I was threatened that if I publicized them, they would never be taken seriously. In the end, they were not taken seriously. So I should have publicized them so that, you know, instead of having all these leaks that we didn't have proposals, that our document would be there on the table and people would have, then have to comment on it. Um, there is a very curious situation in the Eurogroup 
where you are told that, and this is something that maybe somebody here can enlighten me as to why this is. I was told that if we made public, or even if we dared email to the other finance ministers our proposals, then that would be casus belli, I was told, especially in this country, because the finance ministry would have to table our proposals with the Bundestag, which I don't think is such a great disaster anyway. What's wrong with tabling them with the Bundestag? But if they, then, then they, all the members of parliament will have opinions about this, and that, that, that would destroy the process of negotiation. I wish I had not listened to them, and I had published them. Because then you could read them while the negotiations were happening, and have your and then you would have good reasons to be critical of me and my ministry. But at least there would be some substantial dis discussion about the mistakes. The third mistake, big mistake, this one, was that I signed the um, application for the loan extension at the end of February. On the 20th of February, there was a Eurogroup meeting, which actually went very well, I thought, because we established a very sensible common ground between the institutions and our government and the finance ministers, we agreed that we have a new government in Greece, there is an existing program, and we would make some proposals uh, that would keep a substantial part, I even quantified by saying 70% of the existing program and replace the remaining with our proposals and the institutions would pass, pass judgment on this. And my understanding was that this would be the new basis for passing judgment on our government. And that's why I came out on the 20th of February in a celebratory mood. I thought this was a major breakthrough for all of us in Europe with regard to Greece. Three okay. days later, okay. the representatives of the institutions in a teleconference said to me, yes, this is fine, we agree with this, except the previous MOU stands as it is, which is for me, it was preposterous. What was the whole point of replacing parts of it and creating a new list if you're going to be just on the basis of the old list? And still I signed because I didn't want a clash with the Eurogroup at that point, and, and I wanted to win these four months during which hopefully we would come to a sensible agreement. It didn't happen because those four months were not a period during which the Troika wanted to negotiate. They were simply interested in waiting for us to fall on our knees due to liquidity problems and effectively to go back to the previous MOU. In the end, we went back to an even worse MOU. That was an, I, can, I can keep going on with mistakes. If you could give a prize for the, really, for the, for the, 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 the gangster in the game, the most worst <laughs> party in the game, was it the ECB, was it the, uh, the commission, was it the German government? Was it your own I'm prime not, minister? I'm not going to go into this, uh, this particular, because you know what? The worst part was the frustration I felt at not being able to sit down and have a genuine discussion about a program that would stabilize the Greek debt, would stabilize the Greek economy, and which would good, be good for you, Europe and us. Uh, I did mention before that I didn't know who to talk to. It wasn't the IMF, because there were people in the IMF with whom I saw eye to eye. There were other people at the IMF who then were then sent off. Let me give you just one example, right? Just one example. And I won't mention names, but this has to do with the IMF. There was at some, the IMF constantly, on one of the issues that was uh, important to them, uh, they were harassing me, in inverted commas harassing, they were pressurizing me uh, to reduce the number of VAT rates from three, with, with some exemptions for islands, to two, uh, with no exemptions for islands. That was a standard line by the IMF. They believed that the fewer categories there are, VAT rates, the better, because it prevents arbitrage and so on. I kept saying to them that this was not a problem in Greece. <laughs> the problem was that people didn't pay their VAT. <laughs> and I gave the example of Mykonos, you're familiar with that beautiful island, and Santorini, where in 2014, tourist arrivals doubled and the VAT take went down by 30%. I said, look, <laughs> this is not a question of rates. This is a question of enforcement. It's a question of the social contract between the state and the people of Greece and the vendors and so on and so forth. Help us deal with the problem of enforcement. Even I, 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 you know, I'm a left-winger and I was recommending a Laffer 
kind of like argument that we should reduce the tax rates while increasing surveillance in order to increase the tax base and tax debt. Anyway, we were having this discussion was going on in the, in the middle of the night with this particular person, somebody very high up in the IMF. At some point, I, I had enough and I said, you want two rates? He said, yes. So said, okay, 7 and 15% with a surcharge of 3% if people insist on paying cash in order to encourage plastic money because you catch tax evasion better like that. He said, do you mean this? I said, yes. We shook hands. We even had a drink. It was very late at night to celebrate the agreement. I went back to Athens. I had to convince my cabinet of that, my prime minister. It wasn't easy because the islanders would be up in arms because their exemptions would be done away with. I convinced them. I sent my team to Brussels, the Brussels group, so-called, uh, to, to have them to, to, as part of the negotiations. I get a phone call from them saying, What's this 7 and 15 percent you are telling us you had agreed with the IMF on? They insist on 13 and 23. I said, what? Next time I was in Brussels, I came across this high-ranking person in the IMF. I said, hmm, what's this? Didn't we shake hands? Didn't we have a drink? 7 and 15 plus a surcharge for cash? He was looking down on the floor, sort of trying to avoid eye, eye contact, and he said to me, Will you um, acquiesce on labor relations? This was the frustration. You couldn't pin them down on something, have an agreement on this. Let's say we solve this, now let's talk about labor relations. So they were con constantly going from one topic to another, not settling anything, and then leaking to the press, particularly to the Financial Times, that we had no proposals. That was the frustrating thing. Okay. Okay, now I want to go to, let's see, there, who would like to, to, uh, to be, please raise your hands. There's two or three there, here, nobody on this side, one here. Okay, so where are the mics? We start here in the middle, in the middle, in the, the front, in the middle. Okay, first, yeah. My name is Ola King, I'm a journalist, and uh, uh, even though I'm risking producing another portion of toxic uh, headlines, but what do you want? I'm a journalist, my readers are intoxicated. Um, <laughs> and this is a question I didn't bring up, it was your government who brought it up, I think in uh, May or April, something like that, it was the question of German reparations. Uh, in my head is still this, the sum of 287 billion euros that uh, uh, you put forward to ask from Germany. Uh, at, at that time it was um, uh, classified as you were uh, blackmailing Germany with this. Then you went out of office. Now Mr. Tsipras is... With me personally you mean? No, you went out of office. No, let me finish. You went out of office and after that there was no more question about these reparations. Now Mr. Tsipras is in line with the rest of, of Europe, or with the Eurozone, and there's no more question about the reparations. <laughs> was it a hoax, or was it true? Have you ever been okay. be contradicted by a German government in the, in the uh, core of the, uh, the thing? Okay, next question, then there, in the, there. Okay, please. Can I answer yes, that? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, we have to be very careful about these issues because they animate our peoples in ways that are not consistent with what I was saying before, the importance of getting our people closer together rather than further apart. I've always been very careful when I've spoken about this. You will, if you look at the record of everything I have said, I'm now going to speak as Yanis Varoufakis because this is how I'm standing in front of you. I'm not representing any government at the moment, so I'm going to speak as Yanis Varoufakis. Let me be clear on this. My view on this has always been that the period of the 1940s, which is so, such a wound, I think all over Europe, in this country, in my country, has to be dealt with with the utmost sensitivity. On the question of the war reparations, there are two issues Allow me to just make this distinction. There is a question of reparations, 
which is a question that I don't have an issue that I don't have a fixed opinion about. Whether it's been settled, hasn't been settled, I'm not a historian and I don't have strong views on this. There's a second issue, however, and that was an enforced loan by the occupying forces in Greece, for which the occupying forces, interestingly, left um, a contract which is still there in the Central Bank of Greece. Uh, it was an enforced loan which caused massive hyperinflation in Greece and which the German authorities, the occupying authorities, specified what sum they had taken away from the Bank of Greece during the occupation and what interest rate they were proposing to pay for it. So that is different from reparations. This is a loan. The Greek government, well, at least my, the government I served under, the, their position was that this loan, because it exists on a, on a piece of paper, has to be taken into consideration if the position of our governments is that the debt is a debt is a debt and there can be no debt restructuring, there can be no debt write-off. Because when the Greek governments have been asking for a debt write-off or debt relief, the German government usually said that debt is a debt, we don't discuss it. Well, if a debt is a debt and there is a contract and it still has validity, maybe we should consider that debt too. That was a view of the government I served in. But let me now talk to you, Yanis Varoufakis. And I've, I've, I've um, published that, I've said that while I was minister. As far as I'm concerned, these sums are fictitious, whether it's 200, 150, and they don't matter that much. And the point I made, and I remember, I think it was Der Spiegel that published it, I'm not 100% sure, but some, genu some, some significant publication here in Germany. I made the point that I'm looking forward to the moment when we have a wholesale agreement for the Greek crisis, reform program, debt rescheduling, and all that, that Mrs. Merkel comes to Athens to sign with us or to celebrate with us, and she brings with, us, with her one euro to settle that debt as a symbolic gesture that would heal the wounds of the past. That was my position, and it remains my position to this day. Okay, very clear. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Hans Keva. I'm a student at the university here. And I have a very short question. What was, according to you, the best case scenario of the referendum in which you supported? Well, for me, it was what happened. The best case scenario was the no. Simply because the agreement that was presented to me in the Eurogroup on the 25th of June was unsustainable, and everybody, everybody agreed it was unsustainable. Wolfgang Schäuble in the Eurogroup said so himself. Not so much that it was unsustainable, that he could not support it. And this was nevertheless presented to me as the Minister of Finance of Greece as an ultimatum. And I thought it was the right thing to do, to say to, say to the Greek people, look, you didn't give us a mandate to clash with Europe and say no to them. At the same time, as a finance minister, as an economist, this piece of paper is a loan agreement which I don't want to sign because I don't think it's sustainable. You decide. And my recommendation is to, 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 to go for no. But I, I need to be a bit more precise than that. My view always was that we should only have the referendum if we were recommending a no and were prepared to suffer the consequences of the no. When that night of the referendum, I discovered that my government was not prepared to suffer the consequences of the no, I resigned. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. My name is Fröhlich. I'm a member of the Association of Family Enterprises. I'm running my own business and I'm paying taxes. Um, actually, in my opinion, uh, we are kind of financing a tax fraud system. How come I put it this way, this harsh way? Uh, I'm surprised at all the exemptions being given to people or to enterprises who should be able to pay taxes, such as your ship owners, such as the real estate owners of the Orthodox Church, such as swimming pool owners who have to pay a certain 
water tags, if I understand it correctly, but they are covering up their swimming pools when the Greek tax authorities run around by, by a helicopter. So my question is, how come that you take hostage of the European taxpayer for the obligations owed by the ship owners, by the real estate owners? Thank you. That's it. That is a brilliant question. No, no, I, I very much appreciate it, because this is a question that you should ask and I should answer. <laughs> Let's take it step by step, because it's, I, I, you know, I respect this question. Ship owners. Hmm? Comment number one, most of them may be of Greek descent, they may be Greek nationals, but their base is in London. Their company is domiciled in London or in the Caribbean. They have no visible economic activities in Greece, which means that when I was finance minister, it was impossible to actually tax them except to tax their home, which we did tax. Usually the home belonged to some offshore company, but nevertheless, we, we had rules for taxing. So they paid the, the tax that anybody in their position owning that home would be paying. But their economic activities as ship owners were impossible for us to tax without the cooperation of the British authorities, without the cooperation of foreign authorities. And we didn't have that cooperation. Hmm? So it's but, they, but they are living in Greece. They are they live in Greece. Greece. They, they have a home in Greece, but they, you know, they have they, they, they don't even submit a, a tax return in Greece, except, you know, as 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 citizens of, of the United Kingdom, most of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Double taxation legislation shields them from this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Second, you mentioned the church. Well, maybe I, I'm going to be despised by many here by declaring that I'm an atheist. So you, nobody can accuse me of being in the pockets of the church. But let me tell you what the problem is with the church in Greece. The church is extremely asset rich. It's got, they've got a lot of properties. But remember, when I took over the ministry, we were already in a Great Depression. So you have a lot of people who are asset rich, including the church, who have no income. So, so they're asset rich and, and income destitute, not just poor. So what do you do? You go in there and you confiscate the land, you confiscate the apartments, which are empty and they're not even non-performing, they, 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 they are not rented out. This was not my priority. But I'll tell you what my priority was. My priority was to catch the tax cheats, whether they were priests or ship owners or anyone, or professors. And the way we tried to do that, and this is, I'm excited about the opportunity of communicating this to this audience. The way that we tried to do this was through um, a division, a department in the ministry called the uh, Economic Crime Fighting Unit, which um, I tried to energize f with, one, with, with one purpose, to get from the banks real-time data of all transactions within the country and outside the country from Greece to other jurisdictions. And we did manage to get this. A complete record for 20 years. It wasn't easy to get it. The banks were resistant. Lots of vested interests were resistant. The purpose was to create an algorithm, because the other thing you've got to understand is that my tax office was um, lacking personnel and motivated personnel because of the diminution in the number of civil servants as a result of the cuts that we had for five years. And also we had a degree of corruption, of course, this you can imagine. But the people that, that, to, that, that, that uh, undertook to conduct this particular project were untouchables, few people. And the idea was to use software to compare and contrast algorithmically without intervention of human beings these tax file number by tax file number transfers within Greece and without Greece with the tax returns of these tax file numbers for 20 years. Right? And if you have dynamic data, not just a, a snapshot of what people have in their bank account, but you have real-time data, you can make this. So 
we had a one-year project for that. The idea was by end of November, middle of November, this coming November, we would have caught, the estimate was, 550,000 tax cheats who had cheated the Greek state of more than 100,000 euros each. That's a lot of money, and that's a lot of people for a country this, the size of ours. Let me now give you the bad news. After my resignation, and after the Troika forced upon Greece the new MOU, do you know what was one of the main demands of the Troika? That that unit gets disbanded. Let me put it very clear to you. The Troika is the tax cheat's best friend. The tax cheats in Greece are the oligarchs. They are the ones whose press has constantly supported the Troika against our government in the negotiations. If this project was allowed to continue, we would have caught all of them. We were not allowed to. One of the reasons why I was vilified was this. Be very angry. I am. <laughs> that was another, wonder another wonderful headline. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. My name is Wolfgang Ward, I'm an economist. Uh, Mr. Varif Varoufakis, you gave us some very valuable insight into the political system on the uh, Euro stage and the disastrous handling of the Greek issue. So my question is, what is your modest proposal <laughs> concerning restoring politics, restoring the European political system and repairing the Euro system. Thank you. The next one will be the gentleman behind you. Okay, but first you. Hmm? Farkas. Okay, we take it together, please, yes. Sir. First of all, Mr. Farkas, I would like to say you made a good proposal. Don't discuss too much the faults of yesterday, but uh, look forward which kind of future we would like to have. And you continued, we have a single currency, let's stay uh, on the, to the uh, single currency as a basis. Mm -hmm. But then, Mr. Varoufakis, first, the most urgent thing we have to solve is which kind of single currency we would, we would like to have. A currency in the design as, uh, as, uh, as it is designed by the Maastricht contract or a single currency which is in the Franc-Lira-Drachme Franc, Franc, uh, uh, tradition. In the long run, you can't have both yeah. low interest rates and a fiscal policy as used and exercised in the southern part of Europe for long, uh, uh, long periods of time. Except EZ, the EZB will, in the long run, take all public debt and don't answer, uh, look at the, uh, at the states. Uh, the Fed is behave, uh, behaves in the same way. We, then there is a little difference. The uh, US dollar is still uh, the, uh, the main uh, reserve currency. The role of, uh, the, uh, of the euro of a um, uh, reserve currency just is put at risk by Mr. Draghi. Okay, so we take the two, please. Well, the, the, two, the two questions um, are very similar, very relevant to one another, and I shall try to answer both. You are quite right. I should now be looking to the future, and this is what I do, but I can't escape questions about the past <laughs> in fora like this one, as you can imagine. But I, I very much focus on the future. And you're right. I take whatever the flaws and criticisms one has for the single currency, for the euro, take this as my canvas, and I try to imagine what can be done within this canvas in order to improve the prospects of the average European, independent of whether the average European is Greek, German, or whatever. So my modest proposal is that, as I was saying before, we should use the existing institutions within the existing treaties in order to Europeanize solutions to four realms. One is the banking union, 
which you don't have, we only have in name. If you now have one million euros in a Greek bank account, it's worth a lot less than a million euros in a German bank account, so we already have parallel currencies. You don't have a single currency, really. If you have a million euros in a Portuguese bank account because of the greater threat of a bail-in, it doesn't have the same present value as a million euros in Munich. So we have to fix the banking, create a banking union if we're serious about the single currency. And we can do this within the existing um, institutions and treaties with some creative thinking. I'm not going to, I mean, I could, we, we could spend a whole hour talking about each one of these. So banking is one. Um, debt is another. I will refer to the importance of having an interest rate differential between the part of the debt that we were allowed to have and the part we were not allowed to have. There are ways through public finance to do it. Thirdly, the question of investment. I shall insist, and this was somewhere we disagreed, that it is important for the state, um, and in this case for the Eurozone institutions, to in intervene in order to mobilize idle savings and turn them into productive in investments, particularly in green energy, where also the periphery has an advantage but due to weather conditions and so on. Uh, in the United States, they do this, not so much through the federal institutions, but through the military-industrial complex. So when uh, Lockheed or Boeing gets a new contract to build a new fighter jet, the Pentagon says to them, whispers in their ear, yes, but you're going to have to build a factory in Missouri, a deficit state. This is not a transfer union. You don't take money and give it to the Missourians to spend. You create jobs in Missouri that will create a fighter jet. It's a productive, eh? that creates skills, it builds up the human capital in that state, but this is effectively a state-mediated surplus recycling mechanism which solidifies the union. We need to do that, and you, you're quite, quite right about the, the Juncker plan. I can't begin even to um, explain what is wrong with it, because everything about it is wrong. But the European Investment Bank is a different proposition. It has a sterling record so far, it can operate on banking principles, it can operate at an arm's length from governments, and it still is a, effectively it belongs to all of us in Europe. So we should be using it. Uh, let me also give you an example that I think is going to infuriate Professor Zim, who has written so extensively about Target 2. Imagine that, in, in, in my view, Target 2, I'm not in my view, I think that we agree on that, uh, the greater the imbalances, and the failures of the Eurozone, the larger the target to imbalances, and the greater the interest that accumulates. Imagine that instead of distributing this interest, this interest to the surplus countries, imagine that we funded an anti-poverty scheme, not giving money away, but American style, using a system of giving food stamps to poor families everywhere, including in Germany, who receive in the mail a check signed by Mario Draghi from the Euro system to feed their children, whether they are poor families in East Germany, in Greece, in Portugal. Imagine the solidifying effect that will have. In the United States, when poor families throughout the United States receive a food stamp signed by the Fed, that creates that feeling of we, the American people. That would also create a feeling of we, the European people. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you examples of what we could do to solidify Europe within the existing institutions. So time is running out. Let's say we take two more questions. Perhaps other students, because we are here at the university, I would like to, uh, to have at least one student or female, female student, if there is one. <laughs> yes. Is there any, anybody? You are not a student, I can see it, no. No students? You are a student, really? No, okay. There's no student who want to ask a question. Please stand up and uh, that I can see you. Where? Ah, okay, please, very loud, please. No. You need a microphone. The microphone coming. is coming. It's coming. It's the coming. micro is coming. Stay where you are. Yeah, um, oh, you can hear me. 
Okay, um, I have a question. Um, I heard some lectures from uh, Professor Heiner Flassberg, and he said the origin of the Euro crisis is um, in the difference between the uh, productivity in Germany and the uh, unit labor ratio. And this, um, this difference is between Germany and the whole sovereign um, yeah, countries. And is it possible just to um, maybe fix this element and try to avoid the uh, competition between the European countries in the Eurozone to um, yeah, overcome this crisis? Okay, thank you very much. We'll mm -hmm. Take the last, the last question, perhaps. Is there anybody with a very good last question? <laughs> no, you were. Uh, the gentleman just really in the back, in the last row, please. Or oh, isn't it a gentleman? I can't see it exactly. Who is it? No one. No? I can't see the mic, so... We... Ah, okay, now. Wonderful, Still okay. Me. So, th thank you, I'm not sitting in the last row, so... My name is Andreas Hickmann. Um, I read several times that um, Greece has significant resources in oil and gas in the um, Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. Has there any, ever been any discussions on utilizing these significant resources um, in order to uh, clear out the debt and to turn Greece into a kind of second Norway uh, for the future? <laughs> okay. That's a very good last question, isn't it? <laughs> No, please. No. Okay, on the first question, um, with Heiner, we've had this discussion many times. I think that the, uh, the, whether you explain the Eurozone crisis on the basis of competitive devaluation of labor unit costs, or do it the other way, as Professor Zin is doing, in terms of the capital flows, which created inflationary um, forces in the periphery and therefore turn them into uncompetitive. I don't think this is a chicken and an egg issue. The way we constructed the Eurozone, this was going to happen. What caused what doesn't really matter. What it matters is that once it's caused, then the rapture would eventually happen and the bubbles would burst and it would become unsustainable. Uh, but you should, what if, I, if I may just say, uh, the difference in productivity as such is uh, not a problem for a currency union because if the wage differences are equal to the product productivity differences, everything is fine. Uh, the goods prices have to be the same in a common market. But uh, when productivity differences are there, and one country is more productive than another one, it needs higher wages, and then it is not cheaper than the other one. Uh, suppose Look at us here, look at the society inside a country. Lots of people have different productivities and still it's, function, it's a functioning market economy. So if, if Flasbeck has said that it is wrong, but I'm sure you misunderstood him. <laughs> <laughs> so now let me go to the second question about uh, deposits of gas and oil. I'm an economist. I'm not a geoscientist. I have no idea. I hear these stories too. I was listening to them. Um, I will believe that we have these huge resources when I see them. Uh, but allow me to, to make one point which I think is substantial, and it concerns peace that Professor Zin rightly mentioned. This is what I'm going to say is not particular, is, is not going to endear me to my fellow Greeks. If you look at the areas where there is exploration, and they may very well find genuine deposits. Personally, when I look at the map of the Eastern Mediterranean, I cannot imagine a sustainable economic and political process of extraction, which is not based on very close cooperation between Greece and Turkey. The idea that we will 
extract this wealth independently of Turkey, as part of the European Union, going to bed with the United States and Israel, leaving Turkey aside is highly destabilizing, and I do not believe it's the right way of approaching the issue. This, again, is not going to make me very popular in my home country. Last question from my side. Could you tell us a little bit about your future? Will you, go, will you stay in the academic world or will you go back to, to politics? Will you go, go back to government? <laughs> the last bit is not for me to decide, it's for others. But the, I'm, I'm not going to go back to politics because I never, never left politics. I left the government, but we must not confuse government with politics. Uh, I, threw my hat in the political ring last January and I pledged to my electors that I'm not going to abandon them. And what I do here is politics. I believe everybody understands that. For me, we had an opportunity, a window in the first six months of the year to create a new relationship with Europe, to, to, to stabilize Greece, to end the Greek crisis, to stabilize the Greek debt. We failed collectively. As Europeans, we failed with Greeks, the Germans, the uh, Brussels crowd, the IMF, we failed. And now that opportunity closed. If you read the MOU that my former comrades signed in August, you re realize very quickly that it's not a sustainable program. It cannot work. It will fail. It was designed to fail. Um, I think Wolfgang Schäuble may be happy about that because he doesn't think that this kind of approach is correct anyway. The only way of stab stabilizing Greece now is by having a conversation in the heart of Europe, essentially between not just all Europeans, but primarily Paris and Berlin, so they can work out exactly what kind of solution and reconfiguration of the monetary union and the political union that has to come must be. I want to be part of this conversation. This is why I'm going all over Europe. And I believe that as a Greek who is patriotic, it is my duty to become and remain totally engaged in this political dialogue in Europe, because Europe is our common home. We have to make it work. That was your applause. And my last question goes to Hans Werner Zinn. What have you learned about Janis Varoufakis? What did you think about him? So tell us your, <laughs> your feelings <laughs> after these two hours. And this will be the maybe end of the Maybe I should go next audience. door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, if I look around here, see uh, all these people, uh, wise Greek, ancient Greek uh, figures. Uh, I think this room has the spiritus loci for the kind of debate we had here today, listening uh, to a, a courageous economist who dared to leave uh, the ivory tower and go uh, to uh, the, uh, the place where the lions fight. Uh, and he survived, and uh, I, I think this is a great success in a sense, because I have seen so many um, uh, scientists who uh, tried and uh, did it only for a much shorter period of time. Uh, we had a professor from Heidelberg here, for example, in Germany, <laughs> who did not even make it uh, to this ultimate position. No, we as economists and uh, com people coming from the ivory tower are unsuited, I must say, uh, for this political business because we talk frank language and uh, want to exchange the arguments. And you have shown that in a very nice way and brilliant way today that you are willing to debate and I could imagine continuing uh, for a very long time uh, to exchange the arguments. And I'm sure we would come up with, um, uh, with even more common ground than you have seen today. When I think back of my, my school times, um, I have uh, one Greek statement in, in mind, hen dia dioin, one 
expressed through two. In this case, two people. And if there is the common message that economics has something to say about this world and that eco economists have a language to reasonably talk to one another in an objective way about these things, if this is the message of today, I think it is a good message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. 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 Thank you.